Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I am pleased to welcome all of you at a meeting dedicated to Polonus Bis program, um, uh, launched this year by the National Science Center in Poland, supported by uh, Horizon 2020 uh, program of the European Union, and more specifically by the Marii skłodowska curie uh, actions. Uh, Polonus Bis will allow 120 researchers to come to Poland to complete their uh, projects in Polish research institutions. Uh, and my name is Justyna Wozniakowska, I'm the head of the International Cooperation Department, and I have been uh, following the development of Polonus in our institution and all, all the host institutions for the past seven years already, because the first, first Polonus calls which we launched uh, uh, were open in 2015. Uh, and uh, in the first Polonus program, uh, which has already been closed, we invited to Poland 109 researchers. So we have quite a substantial uh, experience with this type of uh, program already. And we are very, very happy today to be able to offer the extension of this opportunity to, to all of you who are interested in, in, in coming to Poland and, um, uh, and uh, completing your research projects here. Uh, uh, this uh, meeting today uh, will last for approximately two hours. Uh, and uh, you will have a chance to talk to uh, Jolanta Palowska, who is the coordinator of the initiative. Uh, she will tell you more uh, about the uh, procedural details of the whole program and about the eligibility criteria. And she will give you full advice on how to apply successfully uh, to, be, uh, to, to be a successful Polonis Fellow later on in one of the Polish research institutions. Uh, then um, uh, Sergei Samsonov will join us, who is a former Polonus Fellow. He will share his experiences with you. He's not here with us uh, yet, but he will join later on and he will tell you what it is like to be a Polonus Fellow in Poland. Uh, finally, uh, Małgorzata Zawiślak, a scientific officer um, uh, at the uh, National Science Center, will explain to you all the details related to, uh, to the uh, peer review, merit-based evaluation and uh, formal evaluation of your proposals. Uh, you will be invited after all these presentations to ask questions. To do that, please use the chat window, which you have on the right side of your screen. Uh, there is an option to write a comment in the chat or to ask a question. Now on the screen, you see how to do it. Click on the question mark, which is there, and it will turn blue after which you can type your question in the box and then we'll be able to show it on the screen after the presentations so that everybody will be aware of what what uh, is the question and uh, the, the what, what we are answering um, at any given moment the presentations will be made available to you so do not worry uh, to to take very detailed notes the event is also recorded and it will be made available uh, on our Facebook page uh, later on. So if you have any doubts about what was said here and if you want to come back to it, you can also do that. Uh, so uh, I want to, to express once again that I'm very happy that we're meeting here today. Uh, I'm welcoming all of you. I hope that it will be an informative meeting for all of you in case you don't manage to, uh, to get uh, answers to all your questions because there may be many questions and the time is short please don't hesitate to contact us later on and we'll be helping you as much as we can because it is important for us that you were uh, applying for the program and that you were successful so now i would like to give the floor to yolanta palowska uh, who will share with you her presentation on the program and the details of the program hello yolanta mm, hello thank you Christina, for this kind introduction um, hello everyone, it is a great pleasure to meet with you all today and um, to share with you the idea, the philosophy behind this program and also some details that uh, will help you to um, apply. Um, thank you very much. Um, yes, the, the outline of our meeting today um, is shown on the screen. Um, some of you um, have asked questions um, before uh, this meeting. And one of the questions was, surprisingly, what is Polonis Bees all about? So um, even if you, when you look at this first slide, you will see that we'll be talking about a postdoctoral fellowship in Poland, uh, a part of the Maria Skłodowska-Curie Actions uh, Program, and also a 
project, a program which involves international mobility and skills training. So um, I will now um, give you um, some data about Polonis BIS in a nutshell. And um, my first question to you um, is, are you ready for a change? And the reason I'm asking this question is that um, we think that Polonis Bees is a kind of pro program, a kind of project that can really be a life changer for you. Now, why is that? Um, the first reason is that um, Polonis Bees is centered on individuals. That means, yes, on you, on each and every one of you individually. Um, in this program, we're looking for talented and experienced researchers from all over the world. Um, and the chance to take part in Polonis is not uh, limited by your age, by your nationality, by your gender, or by your career stage. Um, it is um, a real life changer because it lets you follow your curiosity. Um, the National Science Center funds curiosity-driven research. Uh, we follow the bottom-up approach and we give you 25 NCN panels to choose from in terms of disciplines and descriptors that um, cover the whole area um, of basic research. Another reason why this program could be a life changer for you is that it's a program that funds mobility. And um, it funds mobility, um, it funds your movement to a new work environment, which is seen as a challenge, but also an opportunity for you to transfer knowledge to the new institution, and also an opportunity um, for you to learn from this new environment. It also gives you financial independence in that it funds your full-time employment contract completed um, with um, health insurance and social security package, and it gives you extra money for a research grant. Um, it lets you build a team uh, because you will get to work with a mentor at the host institution. You will be able to hire a new research team if you so choose, or you will be able to cooperate with the investigators already employed at the host institution. Last but not least, um, this is a program in which um, um, we also would like to get you involved in capacity building. Um, you will be able to combine research with transferable skills training and intersectoral segments, and I'll say a little bit about those uh, later on. Um, now, if you think that this is a chance for you, an opportunity for you, the good news is that we are recruiting. Um, which is probably why most of you are here today. This is the first of the three calls for proposals that we are going to have. All of those involve transparent procedure, procedures, objective assessment criteria, and international peer review panels. Um, we have 120 research positions for experienced scientists, and we are looking for either PhD holders or for people who can document at least four years of full-time research experience. Um, all the fellowships that we are about to grant in Polonis Bis are for 24 months, and they are at the host institution of your choice, and the institution can be both academic or non-academic, whichever best suits uh, your research project. Um, finally, um, 25 NCN panels divided into three fields, arts, humanities, and social sciences, physical sciences and engineering, and life sciences, with a uh, complete bottom-up approach, as mentioned before. Um, so the um, calendar, the timeline for the calls is as follows. The red one shows the call which is open right now, but we are going to have two more calls um, with six months span. The current call closes um, on December 15th, so we are almost um, in the middle of the um, proposal um, submission time. Um, with the first call, we expect funding decisions to be um, issued at the beginning of June 2020 and the, the start of the first funded projects in September 2020. So as you can see, there's about um, six months from uh, submission, proposal submission to grant. 
And um, for the first group of people recruited in the Polonis Biz First Call, we are going to have uh, a kickoff meeting, the first networking event uh, combined with career development training for both the PIs and mentors. And this event um, is planned um, late November or early December 2022. It will be organized and paid for fully by the National Science Center. So, um, as with every job recruitment, um, uh, we have prepared some documentation for you. And this documentation, in our case, uh, is a Polonis Bis proposal. Uh, this proposal is pretty comprehensive. And those of you who have already logged in um, under this link here, um, you have probably noticed that we are asking a lot of information. Now, why is that? Because um, the Polonis Bis proposal is where you write your own job description. Um, and we only ask you to complete the comprehensive documentation once, and uh, then it is evaluated um, in two, a two-stage process, and Marco Jata will tell you more about it later on. Uh, but we will not be asking you for any more information during the evaluation process. Um, so what does the proposal involve? Well, the most important thing is for you to plan your research. Um, in other words, um, in the um, proposal, we ask you to choose the MCN panel uh, with uh, the descriptors of the research you're going to follow. We ask you for short and detailed project description, and we also ask you uh, to consider ethical issues in your proposal. Now, why do we ask for a short and detailed project description? Well, it's because the evaluation is going to be conducted into stages. So during the first stage, only your short description will be read by experts. Um, if your uh, proposal is recommended for the second stage, the external reviewers will receive a detailed project description and will make their final recommendations based on the longer, uh, more comprehensive document. Um, the second element of the proposal is where we ask you to tell the reviewers about yourself and about your career so far. So in the proposal, first of all, uh, we would like you to complete um, a document that's called compliance with the eligibility criteria. And we're going to talk about eligibility criteria a little bit more um, in a minute. Um, we are asking about your career breaks, um, and it's okay to have career breaks. And um, the, uh, your career breaks will, um, will not work to your disadvantage in this project. And then we also um, ask you to complete a more detailed academic track record. Um, the third important element of your proposal, which is going to be evaluated, is the part where we ask you to describe the hosting arrangements. And we have um, a separate attachment for that. It is called host institution capacity form. And this is the element of the proposal when you, the future Polonis Bis fellow, future Polonis Bis PI, work together with the host institution to describe um, your working conditions that you uh, agree on together. I'm sorry. Um, okay, sorry about that. Um, so in your proposal, we also ask you to analyze the skill, the skills that you are already good at and to identify the areas for development. Why is that important? Because Polonis Biz is not like any other research grant. Um, it not only allows you to do your research, but it, it, is, um, it, it also focuses on your personal and professional development. And in order to use the two years um, of this grant to um, the best, uh, in the best way possible, um, we ask you to look at where you are right now. And there is, um, again, um, an attachment to the proposal that we have prepared to help you analyze your skills, to help you analyze uh, what you already have. And we call that a career development plan. 
Um, another thing that we are asking you in your proposal is to set uh, goals, both research related and career related, dissemination related. And again, there are questions about your plans in that area in the career development plan. Um, and um, last but not least, we ask you um, to consider the whole project and your goals and estimate the necessary resources and the costs that are going to be involved. In other words, we ask you to plan the project budget. And since we um, have gotten to the financial part of it, well, let's take a look at what the project budget can be. Um, now, I have calculated here the maximum project budget, uh, which is uh, over 250,000 euros. That's uh, over a million Polish swote. And um, for, all the, for all the lump sums, we are using the exchange rate that you can see um, in the right-hand corner. Um, as you can see, the project budget is composed of uh, four elements. That's the pie on the left. And a very important par part of this budget is the salary of the PI. So that's the blue part. Let me now um, take a closer look at each part of this um, budget. So when looking at when when we look at the PI salary, um, it is composed of two parts that everybody will get, um, and that's the living allowance paid by the European Commission and the mobility allowance, um, that is the money uh, which is um, a kind of compensation for the effort that you have to make to move to another country. Uh, so that's the yellow part. There are two more elements of the PI salary that you can claim. Uh, one is the family allowance, um, and this will be paid to those of you who submit a declaration that your family, your spouse, your partner, your children will come here um, with you for at least three months during the project. And um, another allowance is the special needs allowance. Um, that's for uh, PIs with disabilities. And uh, we're using the definition of disability from the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So these two you can cl claim extra if you're eligible for that. Uh, the living allowance and the mobility allowance will be paid to everyone. It is important to note that the amounts given here, uh, both in um, euros and in the Polish currency, uh, these are amounts before taxes. And if you're interested in how much money you will actually get will be transferred to your account. Um, we have uh, calculated the we have estimated these amounts in the guide for applicants. Um, of course, based on the currently available data about the current level of taxation in, in Poland. All in all, the amount of money you get is about three times the average salary um, in Poland. So that's pretty attractive. Let's take a look at the other part of the budget, that is the research costs and overheads. Um, now, it, at the National Science Center, we uh, are perhaps more used to using the term indirect costs. Um, so I have used both terms here to be clear what we mean. Indirect costs uh, come in Polonis bees um, in two different categories. Uh, there are the indirect costs of open access. This is up to 2% of your total direct cost that you can use to pay um, publication charges um, for disseminating the results of your projects um, in open access. Uh, there's also a bigger portion of the pie here, the orange one. These are the um, indirect costs which are normally um, paid to the institution. Um, but even this part of the pie 
um, is something that the host institution um, will negotiate with you, at least a part of it, one fourth of it, they have to negotiate with you in terms of how they're going to spend it. Now, the amounts that you see here uh, for indirect costs and cost of open access are the maximum amount because they are calculated as the percentage of the direct cost. And the direct cost is your salary uh, that you cannot see because it's shaded over, and also the costs of research. Now, for the costs of research, uh, there's a cap on that, um, which is 100,000 euros. And not all projects uh, will actually be able to um, claim uh, the top amount given. It, it really depends on um, what kind of research um, you are going to pursue how big a research team you need. Um, so basically, um, depending on how much research costs you think you are going to incur, the amount of indirect costs will also um, perhaps be smaller in proportion. So let's take a look at what those research costs may entail. First of all, um, you can plan um, to uh, pay an additional salary of your mentor, and there's a monthly cap on that. You can also pay other investiga investigators that you will recruit or assign to the project. Uh, we have no limits here on the number uh, of investigators or uh, the amount of their salaries. Um, when it comes to your research team, you'll also have an option to hire or grant scholarships to students or PhD students. Um, you can also plan to cover from the research grant some other direct costs. For example, the cost of small equipment um, up to 2,500 euros or over um, 10,000 Polish water per unit. Uh, cost of consumables, business trips, um, outsource services, travel and subsistence of any external experts um, that you need to collaborate with you and that you are prepared to invite uh, here to Poland to visit the project. Um, finally, cost of promoting the project or research results, including uh, maintaining the project website. Um, so let me sum up um, again, I'll come back to uh, the question of uh, what you should do before applying, um, how to prepare for, for um, applying and what supporting documents or helpful, helpful links uh, there are. So the first thing that you need to do is think about your eligibility in terms of um, have you got the right experience? Uh, do you follow, um, do, do you fulfill the mobility criterion? Um, will the project um, impact your own career development? Um, and information about how to do that best, you will find it in the call text, in the guide for applicants. Um, when you open the compliance with eligibility criteria, this is also an attachment that will help, help you decide if you're eligible or not. And finally, you'll, you will plan your career development against the questions we ask you in career development plan. The second thing that is in, extremely important is to fight the appropriate host institution. And uh, the word appropriate is very important here because um, um, it, you and the institution, your project, you as a researcher, and the host institution have to be a good match. So um, where can you look for a good institution? Um, you could uh, open uh, the Polonus Beast Partner search tool. Um, you can consult the uh, Euraxis page for research in Poland, or you can also look at researchinpoland.org uh, page, uh, which shows you the landscape um, of Polish research institutions. Last but not least, um, we also recommend that you contact the prospective mentor and the project office or the research and development office in your future host institution so that you can uh, work together on the host institution capacity form so that um, you can think about state aid perhaps because for some institution Polonis funding 
will be state aid. If this is true, then extra documents need to be produced. So it's better to contact the institutions in advance. And it's um, also important that you learn about the internal procedures because it sometimes takes a longer time to uh, for the documents to proceed internally and to get signed. Let's talk about eligibility a little bit. Um, I'm sure that you have already learned about it from the call documents that we published, but just to be on the safe side, let, let me uh, very quickly repeat that. Um, in terms of uh, eligible research experience, as mentioned before, um, you're eligible um, if you have a PhD diploma, and if you do, we ask you to upload the scan of it um, in the online submission system. If you do not yet have a PhD diploma, um, we ask you to examine your previous experience and uh, if you can document at least four years of full-time research experience, we ask you to upload the documents confirming it. What kind of documents uh, do we mean? Um, well, um, if the... Um, First of all, for the PhD, if the original document was not drawn in Polish or in English, then we ask you to uh, upload the original and the translation into Polish or English. Um, for the documents confirming the four years of equivalent experience, we ask you to measure the four years from the date that you obtained a degree which entitles you to start a doctorate. So for most of you, it would be an MA or, or Master of Science, Master of Arts. Um, if you're not sure if your diploma or degree is recognized in Poland, uh, we suggest to ask the host institution, they will know. Uh, or you can also use a system available in Polish and English on the website, website of our sister agency, the National Agency for Academic Exchange. Um, this system lets you very quickly uh, check um, if the document you have uh, is recognized here. And if it is, there's going to be uh, a confirmation that you can print out of the system with an electronic signature of that agency. Um, Another very important eligibility requirement is the um, mobility requirement. So as we said before, um, applicants must move to Poland for the duration of the fellowship. And um, the, the mobility rule also makes sure that it is true mobility. Uh, that is uh, that uh, as an applicant, you have not resided, studied or been employed in Poland for more than 12 months. Um, within three years before the call launch. So for the call, which is currently opened, this means that you have to look at the period of time between the 15th of September, 2018 and 14th of September, 2021. And this is where you, uh, where you examine your own life, look at your memories and pictures and the documents that you have to prove that you have not been in Poland. And this is what we ask you to do. We ask you in a special document to give us a list of the places you've been at um, or you were at during that period of time to list the dates, the country, tell us what kind of document you have to prove that you were actually there and to describe what this document is like. We also ask you to upload the scans of those documents, but the documents confirming the mobility requirement do not have to be translated into English. Um, what is important um, is uh, the very last comment here. Um, that is, um, and this is um, for people who um, had been employed in Poland for more than 12 months um, in this three year period. Um, if you have not um, dissolved your um, employment contracts, uh, then unfortunately you will not be eligible for Polonis Bis. Um, even if during those uh, three years, um, your, you did not actually work in Poland. So if you were on an unpaid sabbatical, you had an unpaid leave of absence from your job in Poland, but the employment contract was still in place, um, this will make you ineligible for Polonis Bis. 
Um, we have some restrictions for applicants, which all result from the fact that uh, from from a, a bit wider definition of mobility. Polonis BIS is um, is a program which funds new cooperation, newly established cooperation between researchers and host institutions. This is why researchers who were previously funded as Polonis fellows cannot apply um, in Polonis BIS. Um, researchers who, uh, in the same three-year period before the call launch, uh, were principal investigators in any other research project carried out at a Polish institutions, cannot apply for Polonis Bs. And also researchers who applied as PIs in other proposals submitted to the National Science Center, um, either in a call that was launched together with Polonis Bs or in a previous call, if the proposal received a funding decision or is still under evaluation or is under appeal, well, this will block your participation in Polonis piece call one. Uh, it is also important to remember that if you are a PI in a proposal, in a Polonis Bees proposal, you cannot at the same time sign this proposal as the representative of the host institution. That would be like kind of entering into agreement with yourself, right? Because the host institution makes certain commitments and you make certain commitments. Uh, so these should be to different people. Now, if you have um, a proposal currently under evaluation and you receive a rejection decision and you would like to apply for Polonis Bs, remember that a rejection decision is in force for 14 days and uh, it can be appealed by the applicant. So, for example, if you receive um, a rejection decision from a previous opus, opus 21, okay, um, you will either have to wait the 14 days uh, or if you re receive your rejection decision very close to the closure of uh, the current call, you will have to talk to the host institution of your opus um, to actually waive the right to appeal. Okay, so so um, if you are if you are in a situation like that, that you have some other proposals in the pipeline, and you may not be uh, quite sure what to do, how to proceed, it's best that you contact us, and we'll explain individual situations case by case. Um, if you have submitted a proposal to another funder in Poland, for example, in a Nava Ulam program or under Polskie Powroty, or you have perhaps an individual postdoctoral fellowship in the pipeline um, with the application um, directly to the European Commission. If, if those proposals are still under evaluation, you may apply for Polonis Bis, that's okay. But if both proposals are funded, you will have to choose which one you will carry out. Um, as um, an, an applicant and future Polonis Bis fellow, you also make some commitments um, for the future, for your time in Poland after the money is actually granted. So first of all, you commit to reside in Poland for 100% of the project funding term. So when we say this is a mobility program and you're expected to move to Poland, we really mean it. Of course, that doesn't mean that you uh, will not be able to do field research outside of Poland. But if your project involves field research, then quite obviously during your employment at the Polish host institution, um, going abroad um, to do this research uh, will be a business trip for you. Okay, So this will still uh, count towards your residence in Poland. Um, you also commit to participate in at least three two-day training courses, developing both research and non-research competencies. So as I said at the very beginning, yes, Polonis Bis is about capacity building, and um, the National Science Center will happily pay for this capacity building, but you have to be there to participate, and that's your commitment as well. And you also commit to carry out an intersectoral secondment phase outside of the host institution, which is the minimum of 14 days. And um, this is something that you do not have to uh, decide in, on in detail right now. Um, if you 
uh, a pretty vague idea of what you want to do. The proposal um, asks you about your general plans and then when the funds are granted for your Polonis this project, um, we will help you in finding the right secondment institution. Um, you also commit not to do certain things. Um, so no double finding. Um, no participation in any international international mobility, except if it's connected with the Polonis BIS project. Um, you also commit not to receive any other salary from um, other research um, projects funded by NCM. And you also commit not to receive any salary from another employer pursuant to an employment contract. Um, and this includes not only employers in Poland, but also employers outside of Poland. So for those of you um, who are thinking about sabbaticals from an institution abroad, uh, yes, you can take a sabbatical, but it has to be an unpaid sabbatical. Otherwise, you will not be um, eligible for Polonis peace. Now, eligibility conditions also refer to host institutions. So we generally have um, a very wide array of host institutions that um, can be chosen in Polonis Bees, regardless of the sectors they represent. Um, in the proposal, we ask you to describe only one host institution uh, or participating entity. This is the institution which will employ you full time. But of course, you may cooperate with more than one institution in Poland or abroad um, to carry out the project and also during short term secondments. Um, remember that the profile of this host institution that you select has to um, agree with the research project you're going to undertake um, and with your professional goals. Uh, the hosting arrangements are described in the host institution capacity form. Um, and again, if the host institution that you're thinking of is outside of the public finance sector, um, if there is a chance that Polonis B's funding will constitute um, state aid for this institution, get in touch with them as soon as possible. Ask them to get in touch with us, with the National Science Center, and, and we'll help um, you and this institution out uh, with the proposal. Some um, situations can also make host institutions ineligible for you. Uh, for example, um, if a given institution employed you within three years before the proposal submission deadline, then this institution cannot be your host institution, Polonis Bees. If you're planning to come back for Polonis to the institution that granted you your PhD, Generally, this, is, this would not be allowed unless, since the PhD award, you left the institution for uh, documented postdoctoral fellowships outside Poland. And the total time uh, of this period of absence would have to be at least three years. And at least one postdoctoral fellowship um, should last an uninterrupted, uninterrupted period of 12 months. And the proposal contains questions about your previous or current employment. And we also ask you to list and document the postdoctoral fellowships in compliance with the eligibility criteria in part two, but only if you are planning to come back to an institution which granted you your PhD. House institutions, of course, also have to commit. And the number of commitments is greater than yours. Uh, so let's see. First of all, they commit to employing you full time in compliance with European Charter for Researchers and Code of Conduct for Recruitment. Um, they also co commit to employ your mentor throughout the entire fellowship funding term. Uh, they um, commit to provide you with free full access to facilities and infrastructure and equipment that you're not going to buy from the project, but it's available in at the host institution in order to make it possible for you to carry out the project. Um, they will also employ or appoint an administrative officer that um, speaks Polish and English fluently, and this person will be helping you at the relocation stage and during the day-to-day -day, uh, management of the project, especially the financial issues, once the project is granted. 
um, they will have to uh, reach an agreement with you on how to use 25% of uh, indirect costs. And finally, they will have to support you in promoting the research outputs, open access publishing, data management. Um, so, um, the, um, because, um, well, we, we talked about different rules for eligibility, um, and now it's time to test you. So I have prepared three questions for you. Uh, they're all based on um, the situation described in this slide. Um, and I would like you now to uh, read the situation described here and help Marie decide if she's eligible for Polonis B. So Marie moved to Poland in November last year. She has been employed as a researcher at the fictional university since then. She has a very uh, interesting research idea. She would like to apply for Polonis B in December this year. And the first question is, does Marie comply with the mobility rule? If you could vote on this, please. And let's see what you think. OK, we shall wait a little bit. Here yeah, we have about 34% of you have voted. Okay, perhaps we can wait for some more answers. She arrived here um, in November last year on the 20th of November. She's planning to apply now. Is she eligible in terms of the mobility rule? Okay, we have about 41, 42%. Okay. Okay, let's see how you have voted. Okay. Uh, does Marie comply with the mobility rule? Uh, yes, she does. Yes, she does. Okay, so it looks like um, it was good that we um, reminded you of the eligibility. Perhaps we will need to uh, look um, at the eligibility in terms of mobility rule again. Remember, the, um, the, the mobility rule says that during the three years before the call launch, um, the applicant should not have spent in Poland more than 12 months, right? No more than a year. So, and we are only looking at the period of time that ended with the call launch. So we're looking at the period of time between September 2018 and September 2021. So if Marie arrived in November 2020, uh, she um, has only been in Poland for 10 years in the period that we investigate. Okay, uh, let's look at another question then. Uh, the same situation. Uh, she has been employed as a researcher at the fictional university since her arrival. Is the fictional university eligible as Marie's Polonis Bishaus Institution? And again, I would like you to vote on that, please. Don't be shy. We, uh, we cannot say who is voting. We only see the overall numbers. Okay, let's wait a little bit. Okay, uh, this time, uh, nays have it. Um, the fictional university is not eligible as Marie Spolone's best, best host institution. So if you answered no, you were right. Now, the reason is that uh, 
for the host institution eligibility, we are looking at whether the host institution employed the applicant during the three years between December 2018 and December 2021. And it doesn't matter how, for how long, okay? If there was a contract of employment, then this institution cannot be the host institution in the Polonis Bees project. And the last question, um, again, the, the same situation, does Marie comply with Polonis Bees criteria for an experienced researcher? Is she experienced or is she not experienced? And again, I would like you to vote on that. Okay, let's wait a little bit. Okay, we have 38% of people voting. Okay, um, this time we did not have enough information to answer this question. Um, if we can come, come back to the slide then, please. Thank you. Um, we know that Marie um, has been employed as a researcher at the fictional university, but we do not know if she is a PhD holder. We do not know anything from this in, in, in this description. We are not told um, how many years of research experience she has got. So in conclusion, to sum it all up, um, in the period we investigate for the mobility requirement, Mary only spent 10 months working in Poland, so she's okay for the mobility requirement. We do not have enough information to decide if she is in fact an experienced researcher, so you have to talk to Marie. If Marie has the required experience, she can apply for Polonis Bees but not at the fictional university, right? Because the fictional university will not be eligible as her own institution. So Marie will have to look for another host. And uh, the presentation uh, again repeats here the three possible places where Marie would have to look. Um, out of these three places, I would only um, like to uh, show you the partner search tool um, with the address and active link on top there in the presentation. But the partner search tool is a special tool, uh, online tool that we have made about available to host institutions and to um, the prospective applicants. And um, this is a tool where you can register um, in to publish your own expression of interest. But this is also a tool that you can use without any registration. As you can see, um, it shows you all the researchers and all the institutions already um, registered in a tool. We, um, it is not mandatory to register in this. Uh, but we recommend it, um, especially if you have not yet found your host institution, because this tool um, makes you more visible, gives you an opportunity to become more visible to host institutions. So um, if you would like to be visible to Polish um, host institutions, register as a researcher, uh, your um, information about you will then be published in a list. And this is just to give you an example of what kind of um, information we ask of you. This is um, who you are, where you're coming from, a short summary of your activities and um, expertise, perhaps relevant publications if you have any um, achievements, and the preferred type of host institution. So um, we would... Um, I'd like to um, recommend um, this tool uh, for you, um, both in terms of looking at host institutions and in terms of uh, advertising yourself as a good candidate for Polonis Bees. 
Um, well, we have spent um, a lot of time talking about eligibility requirements and advertising the program to you and talking about different parts of the proposal. I think it's now uh, high time. Um, I gave the floor to uh, Sergei Samsonov, who um, was, a, was one of uh, 109 Polonis fellows um, in um, our previous editions of the program. Um, Sergei, if you could... Um, now um, show your face and and um, um, turn on your mic. Okay. Thank you very much, and the the floor is yours. Uh, good after good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much, Yolanta, for uh, introduction. So uh, I was a grantee of Polonis 2 and before I start uh, to talk about my experience I would like to mention that I am very glad to be given this opportunity to talk about this experience since for me without no doubt until now uh, Polonis step in my research development was the most important. I'm located at the University of Gdańsk. Um, next slide please. So uh, um, what I'm going to talk about, first I will shortly introduce myself, then I will talk about application procedure, but from quite a subjective perspective, you've heard already a lot of information and complete information from Yolanta, but I will give you uh, some my private experience, and then I will talk about uh, pros and warnings, not really cons, but warnings, what you have to uh, take into account when you apply and when you realize the grant and I'll give some, some summary of the project. Uh, next slide, please. So shortly about myself, I graduated as a biophysicist in St. Petersburg Polytechnic University in 2006. Then I moved to Dresden, to Germany, where I uh, made my PhD in structural bioinformatics. And I stayed in Dresden in a very different project as a postdoctoral fellow. I had my uh, permanent position there but uh, with a uh, run of time, I realized that I would like to, to become independent. And that was the reason why I was applying for several programs, including Polonaise. And in 2017, I came to Gdańsk to the uh, Faculty of Chemistry, the University of Gdańsk, where I started my uh, career as a PI. Uh, next slide, please. So just shortly, some numbers and uh, some short information about my grant. I submitted in June 2016 with the second Polonaise call. The grant was approved in November 2016, and I started uh, its realization in May 2017. So it also lasted for two years. At that time, I think there were um, possibilities also to, uh, to choose one or two years. I was uh, realizing my Polonaise at the University of Gdańsk Faculty of Chemistry and with the title of computational approaches to study uh, protein glucosamine and glycan interactions. So I'm a purely uh, theoretical scientist um, applying for ST, um, ST panel and the budget of the whole project was the maximum possible to 1700 uh, round. 1800 euros. In my project, I was able also to uh, employ uh, two assistants. And in this case, it's important to uh, distinguish if you are working in the experimental field or theoretical field, because for theoretical field, you have a bit more money to employ people, while experimental field, probably when you are very much dependent on the reagents or on some devices you need, you cannot spend so much money on paying other people. So um, as a short uh, outcome of my project, I had 16 publications within the Polonaise grant and my Hirsch index raised from 9 to 17. If you'd like to see uh, more details about the project, just we are very welcome to, to come to the site, uh, protgag.org. Next slide, please. So uh, you've heard a lot from Yolanta about application procedures. So I will just stop at several points, which I think personally for me were important. So of course, the uh, first thing is eligibility and your own expertise. 
based on your own expertise, you have to decide which kind of project you want to uh, submit, project proposal you want to submit. So uh, there is always uh, a balance between feasibility and novelty. And if the reviewers are not really uh, wanting to, to help you, they will punch on one aspect or another aspect. So you have to keep this balance. From one side, you should, uh, you should be sure that with your experience, with your um, previous work, you, you have enough of uh, background to make the project feasible. But at the same time, the project should be novel. So you should not uh, repeat things that you have done before, and you should not simply apply the same methodology to what you have done before. And what is also important here, and uh, here I would be uh, totally agree uh, with, uh, with Yolanta, it's not just a, a normal postdoctoral fellowship, but you should uh, clearly state what was not possible to do in your previous position, even if you had a postdoc fellowship before, and why this was not possible. And uh, in these terms, what uh, your movement to Poland, to a Polish research institution, would uh, contribute to this aim. Now, uh, a very important aspect, I think, is the host scientist that you choose. So, uh, in my case, I think I was extremely lucky, especially when I was talking with other Polonese grantees. I think I had a very perfect uh, position finding Professor Livo at the University of Gdańsk. I haven't known him so well before. I just met him at one of the conferences organized in Gdańsk three years before my uh, application, and we did not talk personally. But he is a leading person in molecular dynamics of the coarse grain systems. So for me, it was interesting to, to ask him if he could uh, be a host scientist. So we had a partial overlap since in my uh, studies I use uh, molecular dynamics, but I use completely different kind of molecular dynamics. So it's also important that you don't have complete overlap with the hosting scientist. Otherwise, what can you bring there into the lab? What can you learn? Of course, you can learn from a mentor, but then you are not independent in this way. So you should have, of course, some uh, some area of research which is common, but it should not be uh, absolutely unique. Then this whole scientist should be recognized in the field. And uh, maybe this helps that you would have uh, previously collaborations with the hosting scientists. In my case, it was not the situation. And of course, what plays a huge role beyond the formalities, personal characteristics. In case of Adam, he helped me both professionally a lot and personally. And especially when you apply for your grant, it's very important to know the insider's information about how the things are done at the university. And uh, if you have never worked in Poland before, then you should more or less be able anyway, to estimate the costs, to, uh, to have them realistically put into your proposal. And in this case, host scientists could be very, very important. So uh, next slide, please. Now uh, about my personal experience in the project. So there are definitely more process than warnings, but I have to mention both sides. So of course, the huge uh, the huge advantage that you get, especially if you move like I did from a postdoctoral position to the PI position, is that uh, you get freedom and independence to perform your own research. So, so on one side, it's uh, really nice and you have a good feeling that you are doing what you want. Uh, at the same time, you have definitely more responsibility, especially if you have uh, other people employed in the project. In my case, I had one postdoc and one pre-doc employed as uh, research assistants, then you can uh, build up uh, pretty new collaborations and you're not, uh, you don't have to, res uh, to be responsible uh, in front of other people and to, uh, to report that you, you build new collaborations and you go your own way. Then what uh, NCN proposes, and I think it's a very nice idea, in my case it's worked pretty well, 
uh, there, there's research visits. You have to visit two labs, or it could be also two companies within or outside Poland during these two years, and you can stay there for a week, at least uh, several days, and you can learn new techniques. It should not be a lab or the company completely related to what you are doing. In my case, I was visiting the labs of uh, my collaborators, and I learned a bit of experimental techniques that they are using there. Then, uh, important point in a Polonaise program is soft skills training. Yolanta mentioned that you can uh, visit uh, five, but at least you have to, to be uh, attending at uh, three soft skills weekends. They were organized in our case in Warsaw by uh, a UK company. So uh, why I think it's important? As researchers, we are too much concentrated on uh, how do we do our experiments or calculations or how we uh, carry out our research, but we are not taught uh, a priori of being a principal investigator and of gaining some soft skills which are important uh, to manage the project. And uh, all of a sudden, you have to deal with budget, you have to deal with administration, and uh, in these terms, the soft skills training meetings were really good. Another aspect of the soft skill training is even if it's side, side effect, you meet also other grantees which are in the same position as you. They just came from abroad to Poland and you share a lot of experience and you discuss and you feel better and you're not so much lost, let's say. Then uh, after you uh, receive a Polonaise grant, I think you have a lot of new grant opportunities in case if you are successful with Polonaise. Because the uh, Marie Curie uh, fellowship is very uh, prestigious. So in my case, uh, I was lucky to get two more grants from NCN and uh, to stay in Poland at least for five more years. Uh, Last but not least, and don't uh, forget about this, you get full NCN support. If you have any doubts about the application or about realization of the grant, just feel free to write to NCN officers related to your uh, panel or to the program at the beginning uh, when you apply and ask. They are very efficient and helpful and I have just a uh, positive experience with this. Now uh, to the warnings. Before you apply and before you uh, make any uh, plan for your budget, uh, just to be sure, uh, contact uh, your university or institution which is going to host you. You can do it directly or you can do it uh, through the hosting scientist. Because there could be some regulations at the university which uh, don't really allow to do something which is not explicitly uh, described in the in the rules of Polonaise. And it cannot be described because uh, all the units could have very different regulations. So this is very important that you ask in advance. If you have doubts, ask NCN first, but then also check what is possible at your university. How employment can be done? How long does it take to employ a PhD student or to employ a, a research assistant and so on? Indirect costs, as you have seen, it could be quite a big port, which you can use for uh, your visits or um, conferences, maybe some, some other expenses. So you should also uh, try to, to regulate this in advance with the university since you have right for 25% of uh, negotiation uh, costs. Then what is very nice in uh, Polonaise bees in comparison to the Polonaise program is that you already have an administrative uh, responsible person which is going to help you with all the bureaucratic issues. This is a huge, huge uh, advantage for uh, scientists who come to universities where I have never worked before. The same applies to the reports. If you uh, have any doubts about how the reports, grant reports are written, just try to, to ask in advance. And finally, uh, Poland as the uh, country for foreigners could be very different from other countries for foreigners in Europe. And since uh, myself, I'm not a European uh, Union citizen, 
Um, I was lucky enough to have my uh, permanent uh, European um, permanent, uh, residence permit uh, issued from Germany, but the Polish one, which you have to get in case you're also not a European Union uh, citizen, you have to apply very much in advance and you wait for from half a year until one year, although according to official regulations, it's one month. So just be, be uh, ready that if you don't have other papers, then you could have problems with traveling. But I hope, uh, I hope the situation was like this in Gdańsk and is not uh, like this in other cities. Altogether, I would say that there are some warnings which are much, much smaller than the uh, advantages and the great opportunities which are uh, here thanks to this amazing program. The next slide and the last one. I uh, just to summarize everything, I just want to uh, encourage you to apply, especially uh, since uh, you you would see uh, you would see that you could have a very uh, huge jump in the uh, quality of your research when you move to independent position. If you have any questions, maybe more detailed questions about how it works in practice, just uh, drop, uh, drop me a line. There is email address of mine here. And uh, again, uh, using this opportunity, I would like to thank the Polonese team for, uh, for providing all this support several years ago when I was realizing the grant. And thank you very much for your attention. And with this, I would like to, uh, to invite Gosha as the next presenter of the talk. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Sergey. Uh, my name is Mokrzata Zawislak, uh, and uh, in the NCM, I'm responsible for conducting peer review evaluation process. And today, I would like to briefly introduce you to the proposal evaluation process uh, in the Polonese BIS program. Uh, so uh, let's go to the program. So uh, the diagram uh, shows you the two-step peer review procedure, which will be used in all Polonese BIS calls. And firstly, uh, after submitting the proposal, we will check whether the application is eligible or not. And then all eligible uh, applications uh, uh, we will send to members of the expert panels who evaluated them individually. And each project will be evaluated by two experts. Mm. After that, uh, the expert panel will meet, compare projects, and decide which should pass to the second stage of the evaluation process and which should be rejected at this stage. And uh, all shortlisted proposals will be evaluated uh, by external reviewers in the second stage of evaluation process, which are specialists in the project subject. And if there is a need, uh, these proposals will be also evaluated by ethical experts who will evaluate ethics issues of proposed research. Uh, then the expert panel will meet again uh, verify external reviews uh, and interview the candidates. And based on that, they decide uh, on funding of the applications. Uh, so uh, they prepare a ranking list uh, with proposal recommended for funding, uh, but they also prepare a waiting list with well-rated proposals, which fall outside the limit of available um, funds allocated to the call. And these proposals could be funded in case of any applicant resignation on the ranking list. Uh, yeah, of course, all applicants receive uh, feedback from uh, experts. Yes, this, this brings me to the end of the evaluation process. And now uh, I would like to move to proposal evaluation criteria. Uh, so the evaluation form for experts consists of two parts. Uh, generally, yes, no questions and scored questions. And uh, as you see on the screen, the first question regards the reliability of the proposal preparation. And because um, then, because the NCN support only basic research in Poland, there is also a question whether the proposal concerns basic research. And we 
uh, as an uh, as the ancient defined basic research as an experimental or theoretical endeavors undertaken to gain new knowledge of the foundation of phenomena and observable facts without any direct commercial use. So uh, generally, we accept first row levels in the technology readiness level scale, but uh, uh, the final decision on that is always on experts. Uh, there are also uh, there are also other yes no questions uh, like about data management plan ethics issue interdisciplinary nature of the project and costs and here please remember please remember that in the ensign there is no cost negotiations uh, so the expert panel uh, will check whether costs are justified or not uh, justified with regards to the proposed research. Uh, and if not, the project will be automatically rejected. Then we have the first uh, scored question uh, about the scientific quality of the research project, uh, where the originality and innovative nature of the project will be assessed. And here also methodology and um, work plan will be evaluated. Uh, in the next point, uh, experts evaluate uh, the potential impact of the project on the research field. Uh, and uh, in the next uh, point, experts will evaluate qualifications. Uh, I'm sorry, experts will um, evaluate uh, uh, a plan for dissemination of project uh, outputs, uh, including high quality research publications uh, and how uh, results of the project will disseminate and exploit within the general public. And then, <laughs> uh, then in the next criterion, experts will evaluate qualifications and scientific achievements of the applicant. Uh, they will take into consideration track records of the PI, output of previous uh, projects, presentation to internationally established conferences, prize, prizes, awards, uh, and other research activities. But uh, they will also take into consideration uh, um, other, uh, other competencies like managerial or intersectoral experience. Uh, but not only PI uh, will be uh, assessed by experts, uh, also mentor. And uh, here, besides research achievements and qualification, uh, also experience in mentoring and supervisioning uh, research will be uh, assessed. Uh, then um, in the next point, uh, experts will evaluate host institutions in terms of the relevance of the choice. So quality, uh, also quality of the facilities, opportunities for integration of the applicant into the existing uh, team and international networking and possible mutual gain from knowledge transfer between host and the applicant uh, will be also evaluated. And uh, at the end, at the end, expert will evaluate the impact of the project on the uh, scientific career development of the applicant and possibility of getting transferable and intersectoral skills by applicant. And um, Mm, all these seven criteria are sorted from one uh, to five, and as you see, have different weight. And um, please remember that successful proposal should get at least seventy percentage of uh, points. And now uh, we have come to the question: Who will evaluate it? Evaluate the proposal. So uh, there will be three international expert panels. Uh, one in life sciences, one in physical sciences and engineering, and one in arts, humanities, and social sciences. Uh, members of these panels will be selected by the ancient Council, and they will represent different disciplines, uh, but uh, they will not be necessarily uh, special specialists in the subjects uh, of the proposals. Uh, they will prepare assessment of application at the first stage of evaluation process, based on the short description of the project, five-page uh, short description of the project. So uh, please remember that this five-page project description should be understandable 
also to non-specialist panel members. Uh, these experts also, at the second stage of evaluation process, uh, they will um, also select reviewers for proposals, uh, here spe specialists, um, conduct uh, interviews with candidates, uh, and recommend applications for, uh, for funding. Uh, besides uh, panel experts, uh, also external experts uh, will be engaged uh, in the evaluation process as reviewers. And they, they will be spe specialists in the subject of the proposals and they will assess projects uh, based on the 15 page detailed description. At the, uh, at the second stage of the evaluation, there will be also ethical experts, as I said before. And uh, at the end, uh, I would like to mention, to mention an interview which is planned with all candidates at the second stage of evaluation. Uh, the interview will be conducted remotely uh, online, so applicants will not have to come to Krakow. And information about the exact date of the interview with reviews will be sent to candidates within 15 days in advance. But now I can say that we plan interviews in the first half of May. And finally, um, results. Uh, so we plan to publish them no later than in the first half of June 2022. So people who will not receive funding in this call will have possibility to resubmit the proposal in the next calls. Uh, thank you very much. That's uh, all from me. I hope this will help you to prepare a competitive proposal. And before the Q&A session, uh, Yolanta has a summary for you. Yolanta. Thank you, Malta, but I think the takeaway message will come after the questions. Mm -hmm. So um, if you if you guys want to hear the takeaway message, you will have to be here till the very end. So uh, I think we are now ready um, to answer the questions. Thank you very much for asking them. Q&A, please. Sorry for we're waiting for the technical team to show us the questions. Just give us a minute. Okay. Uh, the first question is, are there any limits to the number of PhD students who can be supported from the grant? Uh, no, there are no limits on that. Uh, remember that PhD students are uh, take away from this 100,000 uh, budget for research costs, right? So um, you can employ as many as you wish, but remember about the general cap on research costs. Next question, please. How do you define the most important publications? Should one focus on the first, last authorship, impact factor, number of citations, if the topic um, of the paper is related to the topic of the proposal. I think, Malgojata, this is for you. Yes, of course. Uh, uh, I, I, I think, uh, first of all, uh, you have remembered that uh, excellence of the research is the most important issue here, uh, but you will also have to balance the other uh, aspects of that. Uh, for example, if you would like to show that you are a leader or owner of the idea in the research, it's good to show um, papers with first or last authorship. And um, if you would like to show that uh, you are experienced in the topic of your proposal and you have some uh, research before um, on that, that's good to show these papers too. So that depends. I would like, I, I think I would say that uh, this should be balanced, yeah, the other aspects. But uh, first, the excellence of your research uh, is the most important. Um, Sergei, do you have any insight to add on that, perhaps? Um, for me, actually, this was quite a, also a tricky uh, thing because uh, I'm a theoretician. And uh, in my reviews, I think by two reviewers, I had critics that my papers are not did not have such a high impact. 
because basically in our um, area we uh, if we work alone we reach four or five if we are within the collaboration project we can reach more so i think that's a tricky tricky question for the reviewers and if the reviewer knows the area very well then he will adequately uh, handle this question so. yeah can i add much. something uh Yola? I would like to add that uh, now, uh, now the NCN declared that we'll not use uh, impact factors, uh, uh, index Hirsch and others, but they will. Uh, we will look on your research, so the quality of the research. So, uh, Polonis was six years ago. Now we will be. We will focus more on uh, quality of the research, not numbers and uh, other factors. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Can we have the next question, please? Uh, if I have been granted miniatura for the next 12 months, may I apply to Polonis? Um, well, if you have accepted miniatura, um, then unfortunately you may not apply to Polonis. Next one, please. Um, question about mobility eligibility rule. What about stays in Poland that were interrupted? How does this count towards the mobility rule? Does that make one ineligible? For example, if a researcher was in Poland for family reasons, March, December, 2020, then traveled to Germany for work, December, February, 21, um, returned to Poland for family, for family reasons in February, 21. Um, Okay, in the um, compliance with the eligibility uh, criteria form, we ask each applicant to map uh, the complete uh, period between the 15th of September 2018 and the 14th of September 2021. And there should be no gaps in this report. And generally, if, um, if you were in Poland for um, family reasons, especially if they were short stays or vacations, um, you do not, um, I mean, th th this, th th this is not something that you report. Now, when you say that you were here for family reasons between March and December 2020, um, this is like um, nine months already, right? So um, it's, well, during the eligibility check, we will be uh, looking at the documents you provide to show us what you were doing there. Um, and we'll be adding um, the periods of time you spent in Poland. Um, so I, I think this in this question, I would say I do not have enough information at this point um, to say whether such a long stay uh, would make you ineligible. Um, but if, um, if you were not employed anywhere during those nine months um, and you, you cannot provide any document showing your involvement abroad during this period of time, um, this might be difficult to account for the eligible period of time. Of course, you also have to, we also have to remember that this was during the, this was during the pandemic already, uh, during the pandemic. So, um, um, yeah, it, it, it depends on what you will say um, in the description and in the documents that you provide for this point uh, in your compliance of eligibility. So, so this is something we'll have to decide on case by case basis. Is it a good idea to apply with a mentor who is a young group leader and less publications grants mentoring experience than a well experienced mentor? Um, Malkojata, I will delegate this to you. <laughs> Good question. Uh, but I would say that better is to choose experienced uh, mentor uh, who has uh, experience in uh, mentoring and, and has uh, and has. Uh, a good public track record, yeah, publication track record. But of course, if uh, if the match is uh, uh, is good, if you uh, 
uh, land there in the in the um, uh, 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 a lot with 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 this mentor. Uh, it's possible, but uh, yeah, well experienced mentor is, is better, I would say. <laughs> But the qualifications and scientific achievements of the mentor um, weigh ten percent of your overall um, evaluation mark. Um, so perhaps this is also some kind of hint. Next question, please. Um, are there informal requirements for the mentor in terms of his/her status at the research institution, habilitation, professorships, and so? No, we do not um, have such requirements. Um, the mentor is a person who um, also completes the academic track record in the proposal. So the experts will be looking at the achievements of the mentor in relation to the status uh, declared at the beginning, right? So, uh, so I think this will be taken in proportion to the career stage of the mentor. Next question. Should the most important scientific achievement be related to the topic of the proposed project or can be related to another field of study? How do you define the most important scientific achievement? Is it in terms of impact to the society, impact factor of the paper, etc.? cetera? Um, uh, yes, uh, we do not specify uh, what you should um, uh, display <laughs> in this part of the um proposal form uh yes it could be uh, related to the topic of the proposed research but it uh, it does not have to be uh it's up to you uh, again i would say that uh, scientific achievements is the most important uh, mm, here and uh, it depends what you would like to uh, show or prove by uh, by these scientific achievements yeah Yolanta. <laughs> no further comment on that. Um, another one for you, Mogorzata. Do scientific lectures and presentations relate to presentations at conferences only or also specialized courses, companies, universities? Yes, you can also show uh, other uh, um, scientific, I would say, um experience uh, like so so you can you can um show that you uh took part in courses uh and uh, yeah i would say that all other uh, scientific um activities uh you could you could show in your in your cv in the proposal yeah. that would be um advantage of course Uh, according to my understanding, I cannot be employed by host institution before the end of the call, December 15th. Does, does it mean that I can't be offered the contract of employment? What about the civil law contracts, such as contracts of mandate or contracts to perform a specified tasks? Um, thank you very much for this question. It indeed is a very important difference. Um, so um, when we say that the host institution should not have a employed you, we mean uh, employment contract under the Polish labor law and the civil law contracts are uh, contracts of mandate or contracts to perform specified tasks do not count as employment. Now, if you have signed some kind of contract with uh, your host institution or prospective host institution, now you are not sure which kind it is, uh, please talk to the human resources uh, or perhaps a colleague, okay? Uh, they will be able to uh, explain to you what kind of contract this is. Um, in which subject area the research proposal based on chemical science will be considered? 
uh, will it be physical science and engineering? Uh, the general answer to that would be yes, this would come under ST. It really depends on what you're going to do with this um, based on chemical science, because depending on where you go with it, it would also come under life sciences. So you really have to, when you, when you click on the NCN panels and you see the major panels with numbers, but if you, um, um, if you click further, you will have more specified descriptors. So basically you have to, uh, you have to scroll through those more specified descriptors to find the good match. And remember that um, in the proposal, um, you have to uh, indicate one main panel, but um, you can also add uh, more sub panels to it, up to three. Um, so this may help uh, those of you who do not have um, a very clear-cut description of what you want to do. And, and, and we do invite our interdisciplinary projects as well. Questions about the PhD students who can be supported from the grant. Uh, can they be from outside Poland? Um, yes, generally all the investigators you uh, recruit for the team, uh, they can be from outside Poland. Um, the point is, if, if, if these people are to be on your team, um, they will have to sign some kind of contract with the host institution to perform specific tasks and to get um, to get um, their salaries or, or scholarships. Um, depending on what kind of tasks are assigned, it is also possible to have. Um, a somewhat dispersed project team. Okay, that is that the members of your team um, do not have all do not have to move to Poland. No, not all of them, right? Um, so it really depends of what kind what kind of tasks they're going to do, what kind of a degree of supervision they will need from you. Okay, so but but yes, they can be from outside Poland as well. Is there a need to announce the contest for the positions of PhD students and co-investigators or particular employees or students can be taken into account already at the time of proposal submission? Um, now, at the time of proposal submission, um, we, um, we do not... Um, Actually, we ask you not to provide any specific details about the people that you have in mind, even if you have someone in mind. Okay, the, the proposal is designed in such a way that only the principal investigator and the mentor uh, have to reveal their names and they have to reveal their professional CVs, the academic track record. Um, and they are actually um, evaluated. Now, for all the other investigators, uh, we keep them anonymous. Um, and we advise you to do precisely the same for PhD students. Uh, do not mention them by name. At the, um, at the point of um, completing the proposal, um, we do not ask you to decide if these students uh, will actually be employed based on some kind of employment contract or civil law agreement or whether um, you will choose them by means of the contest, as you say, um, to receive scholarships. You do not have to decide that now. There is a separate budget line for PhD students and um, you simply have to budget the money for this particular budget category and you can decide later on if you decide perhaps together with your mentor that you indeed want to grant scholarships then yes the scholarships have to be granted according to the national science center's regulations and uh, to grant um, a scholarship to someone you have to have an official contest for those positions. But you do not have to grant scholarships. You may sign um, different kinds of agreements uh, with PhD students uh, and pay them based 
on different contracts. Uh, so this kind of also answers part two of the question, which says, if some students can be specified in the proposal, how to cope with the student who will change the status from master to PhD during the duration uh, of the project? Uh, as I said before, uh, you do not have to specify. Um, actually, we ask you not to specify in your proposal. Um, whether these students will be MA or PhD students. Okay, all you have to, all we ask you to do is decide what kind of tasks these students will be doing and what kind of competences are required. Um, and um, in that way, it doesn't really matter um, whether they change their status. Um, if the question about the P, switching to PhD student, is this, uh, if this question is in fact about the doctoral school, um, this will change the rules of play a little bit and it would be best to talk to your host institution about it. But remember that um, since you have an option to sign contracts with your students or to uh, have a contest for uh, a scholarship for a PhD student, um, I think you can um, you can design your budget in such a way if you give those students different tasks at different um, at different stages of your project that it, it, perhaps it could be planned in advance that, that in such a way that you'll be able to cope with the change of their status. But this is something that you have to discuss with your host institution because the host institution will definitely have some um, internal rules about situations like that. Is it possible to involve organizations outside Poland? Can they receive a part for the fund? Uh, it is possible to involve organizations outside of Poland, but they cannot receive any budget. Um, not the budget for an organization. Um, in the proposal, there is a special part where we ask you for, for information about international cooperation under the project. And this is where you um, can tell us uh, which organizations you plan to work with. You will not be able to pay those organizations. You always have an option to invite um, an investigator from an expert from this organization uh, to, for, for a consultation on your project. And in such a situation, um, you can pay their uh, travel and subsistence cost if you need them to consult. Uh, or you can think about uh, signing a short-term contract with a researcher uh, from another organization and have this researcher on your research team uh, for if you can assign a research task to them. Uh, based on the previous Polonis calls, what is the success rate? In previous Polonis calls, uh, calls our overall success rate was uh, almost 10%. Um, this is lower than the typical success rate um, in, f at the National Science Center, but this results from the fact that we have secured uh, the money from the European Commission uh, to fund 120 research positions. So we cannot fund more uh, because this is what our grant agreement with the European Commission uh, is all about. It's very difficult to say what the success rate will be right now. Um, do applicants with longer postdoctoral training or, or currently unemployed or without history of independent research grants have lower chances of being, of being awarded Polonis? Um, I wouldn't say so. Um, it really depends on the contents of the career development plan. Um, looking back at previous Polonis grants, uh, we had about 20% of applicants who were uh, within three years after their PhD, um, about the same um, up to eight years after PhD. 
Um, so I would say it was pretty level. Some For some people who were Polonus fellows uh, previously, Polonus was the first ever grant after their doctorate. Um, so it really depends on uh, how you uh, write your career development plan. Um, okay, in which domain high energy physics comes under ST2 fundamental constituents of matter? My guess would be yes, but if you click on ST2 and go to those sub panels, perhaps you will find something even um even more uh, even closer to what you would like to do in your project um, what do you think Malkoshata? yes that's good advice to to look uh, on uh, sub panels and check where you should uh, uh, submit your proposal yeah. mm -hmm. but it's always your decision we cannot help you with that yeah okay. What is the maximum pages of proposal? Um, there is no overall limit for the proposal, but different parts of proposal have their own limits. So for example, for the short description of the project, uh, so this is the description of your research that is going to be evaluated during the first stage by um, NCN experts. Uh, we ask you for five pages, um, and those five pages include um, um, references to publications, right? Um, for the full description or detailed description of the project, which is evaluated by external reviewers at the second stage, the limit is 15 pages. The contents of those descriptions have to address the five um, questions uh, that are specified in the proposal. So like the, the content has to be about roughly the same, right? But, um, but the maximums um, differ depending on um, depending on uh, which description this is. So um, we have included whether, where, wherever there are limits, for particular attachments or documents, they have been indicated in the instructions on how to um, prepare and sub submit the proposal. So my advice would be uh, refer to the instructions, follow the instructions closely, and those page limits are also given in the proposal submission system itself. Okay, so we have put them in more than one place uh, um, and um, so that you have that uh, information at the ready when you need it. Can I start to work at the host institute after the cold deadline, but before the results are announced? Uh, technically, yes, you can. Um, so yes, you can sign an employment contract um, after December 15th. Um, this um, will not block your uh, Polonis BIS application now, but um, should you, if you're not successful in the first call, and if you then decide that you would like to apply for the second or third call, this will make you ineligible for the further calls. Can other employees from the House Institute be employed in the project? Yes, uh, you can have co-investigators uh, who are already there, um, and you can uh, you can pay them additional salaries on top of what they already have. Yes. How many positions will be awarded in each call? Now, um, as said, we have 120 openings in three calls. Uh, for the first call, um, we have 48 million zloty, which is about 35% of the available budget that we have. And now, um, remember when I was talking about the 100,000 euro limit on the research costs? Um, if everybody, who we fund goes for the maximum amount of money, we'll be able to fund 42 grants. But if some uh, research proposals uh, will not require 
the top limit, we might be able to fund more. So it, it's really too early to say, uh, but we're expecting to to fund um, at least 42. Um, please remember that the experts who evaluate the proposals may decide that there are not 42 proposals excellent enough to be funded. So we have the money in this call to fund 42 with maximum budget, more if there are some cheaper proposals, uh, but we do not have to fund that many depending on the excellence of the research proposal. Second man, should we have some invitation agreement from the host of the second man during the proposal phase? Should we go for second man in Poland or outside Poland is also okay. Um, you do not have to have uh, invitations or agreements with um, second man institutions at the time of the proposal. This is probably too early. Um, it's okay to choose the second band in Poland or outside Poland. Um, Sergei um, said before, um, made a reference to research visits in the first Polonist and indeed uh, in previous editions, we required two shorter study visits. Uh, with Polonist bees, you can have one second band institution and decide to visit it um, more often. Right, so at least one stay has to be two weeks. The rules change slightly, um, but we made uh, the second um part more flexible for you. Um, so if you if you make up your mind, if you have already made up your mind, you know who you are going to visit for second uh We simply ask you in your career development plan. We ask you to give us the name um, of the second mint institution of your choice. Um, and, and, and describe what this institution does. But um, the career development plan is going to be um, a living document during the, um, the, during the project. So you will be able to change your mind later on. Um, and we'll be pretty flexible about that. Um, can I upload a confirmation of PhD instead of the diploma? I don't have it yet as I'm fresh PhD. Um, no, the answer to this would be, um, we'd rather you know, you don't do that. Okay, so um, when we ask you, do you have, are you a PhD holder? If you say yes, then uh, you should um, upload your PhD diploma. If you do not have the PhD diploma yet, um, in your proposal, you should say, um, formally, I don't have it, right? And then give us documents uh, um, certifying four years uh, of um, equivalent um, experience, research experience. We would assume, well, we, we accept that um, a four years of doctoral program that you probably have completed before getting your PhD, this is enough uh, a confirmation of your participation in four, four years of the doctoral program um, is enough uh, to document having four years of equivalent research experience. <clears throat> Some applicants have to be in the field outside Poland to run their experiments. Is there a limit in the duration for such field studies? Um, no limit is set. Um, we would normally assume that you would also spend some time in Poland at your host institution as well, because it has to be transfer of knowledge, right? So, so I mean, in, in a normal life of, of, in, of a research institution, you would also have to be occasionally present for some meetings to, to report on your findings, right? To, um, to get integrated with, um, with the team. Um, I don't know if, if, if uh, anyone would like to add anything to my answer to that. No, no, thank you. Okay. 
<clears throat> the program is for 24 months, and if one considers to hire a PhD student, in that case, he will stay for three years. So is there any possibility to get any extension in the funding? Um, uh, no, there is, um, it, it's not possible to get any extension in the funding. Um, I'm not sure why this, why a PhD student uh, has to stay for three years. Um, I'm not sure why this should be a requirement, uh, but if it really is um, important or necessary in case of your research project, I would suggest that you um, talk to your host institution uh, because the host institution um, may decide to um, use their own funds to uh, extend the research tasks of the PhD student, if I understood the question correctly. Can we exclude the reviewers for a conflict of research? Yes, of course. Uh, uh, all experts declare that they do, do not have conflict with proposals uh, which they uh, evaluate. So, of course, we will try to uh, find <laughs> all, all a conflict also. Conflict. At the very end of the proposal, in the proposal submission system, there is also this extra um, question. There is there's a section called experts. Um, and uh, the instructions for this say, complete this section if you feel that some people should not be involved in the evaluation of your proposal due to a potential conflict of interest. And this information will only be visible to the NCN and employees who um, conduct the checks. And, and so it will not be revealed outside of the NCN. Uh, so... Um, Yes, you can exclude uh, specific reviewers by giving their names in the proposal. If a PhD student has been doing research for more than five years, but has no publication, but has good recommendation letters, is it eligible to apply? So if you have more than five, five years of uh, relevant research experience, that would be okay for experience. Unfortunately, at least one publication has to be attached, uh, uploaded in the system in order to apply. So, um, yeah, if, if you do not have any publications, uh, it would not be possible to, to apply in Polonis 1. But um, there's one more year till Polonis 3. So my suggestion would be start working on this publication and you may still be eligible for Polonis 3. Um, can, should reviews be included in the top three papers list or should we rather include the research-based papers? No, no, we do not uh, ex um, expect for from you uh, uh, reviews, of course, yeah. But I'm wondering if perhaps this uh, this question is about uh, you know like um, research based papers as opposed to the reviews. No, um, I'm sorry. So, um, the question is not clear. Uh, huh? So. I, Ilona, if you could, um, if you could specify, okay, uh, what you mean? Because is do, do you mean reviews done by you instead of a research-based paper, or or research-based paper together with the review it received from someone else? We're we're not clear here. How the optimal diploma translation certification should look look like. Um, no, we do not require you to have a sworn translation, okay? So just a translation so that we can understand uh, what's, um, what's in the diploma, right? Is there a way to submit an application as two PIs co-supervising a joint project or to submit two applications explicitly mentioning 
planned close collaboration with another applicant or any other possibility to jointly realize a research idea, which is a joint work of two eligible candidates willing to move to Poland. Um, okay, there's a clear answer to the first question. Uh, you cannot submit a proposal with two uh, co-PIs, co-supervising a joint project. You will have to uh, decide um, on one PI and the other person would have to remain anonymous. Um, as to submitting two applications explicitly, explicitly mentioning close collaboration with another applicant, um, I guess this would be, this would be possible. However, you, it might be a bit risky um, because the experts will also look at feasibility and uh, if one proposal goes through and the other does not, then what happens? Um, what happens to the pr first project if the second partner is not funded? So, so it, it, it might be difficult to, to, to show the feasibility of, um, of such a plan. I don't know, Magosata, if. Uh, Yes, yes, I agree with you completely, sir. Will an applicant who will prove unsuccessful in the last stage of the current Polonis bis evaluation be able to apply again in June 21? Will there be enough time to reapply? Uh, Okay, um, we think that there might be some time to reapply right away, but it will not be a lot of time. So um, one thing is that um, if you are rejected early in the evaluation process, you will receive your rejection um, with the reviewer's comments much earlier. Uh, but if, for example, you are on a reserve list, that is, your proposal is quite okay, but we simply didn't have the mo enough money to fund you, right? So you will get um, a rejection decision then, and it will probably be at the very end of May and the very beginning of June, so you'll have approximately 15 days um, to apply for Polonis Bees. Um, so, if this is the case, you have to remember about two things. Um, start completing your Polonis Bees 2 um, proposal much earlier. And then the moment you receive your rejection decision, then you have to immediately write an official letter to the National Science Center uh, in which you will waive your right to appeal the first decision. Okay, because uh, the, your rejection decision uh, that you will receive at the beginning of June uh, will, be, uh, will be open to appeal for 14 days. And this is what's blocking you for submitting your uh, second Polonis Bis proposal. So if you waive your right to appeal, uh, there will be a narrow window for you to actually submit for Polonis Bis call to. Is it a handicap to be a senior uh, applicant 10 years after PhD, but interested to do research in Poland? Um, I wouldn't say it's, um, it, it's, it, it's a handicap. Um, it, as said at the very beginning, we do not have, there's no age limit. Uh, there's no career stage limit. Uh, you have to remember that the career development plan it's a document which we tried. Uh, we tried to make this document pretty balanced. So, if you are, um, if you have just secured your PhD, uh, you will be able, perhaps, you will be able to identify more areas for development, and it might be more difficult for you to think about knowledge transfer from you to the institution. If you are ten years after PhD. Um, your, um, the section of the career development plan, which is um, dedicated to the transfer of knowledge between you and the institution, that will be easier to write. 
uh, but you will probably have to spend more time on planning how um, the project will impact your own further career. Um, so I would say um, all stages are equally welcome. Just uh, take time uh, to uh, write your answers in the career development plan and when you, where you define your goals. Um, I would just like to address one thing. Um, uh, we, had, uh, we had one question where we were not quite sure what the question was. Uh, is, there, um, is there a follow-up on that? I don't think so. Okay. Um, Sorry, I said it's on the last on the list. So please uh, display it on the screen. The last one, perhaps? Yeah, the explanation. Um, maybe I can read it. Uh, the question uh, was about review paper. Review of certain scientific topic done by my uh, me based. Yeah, exactly what this I mean. No? mean uh, review based on other people's publication was research based paper based on my research i assume that the research based papers would be a better idea uh, thank you very much ilona for explanation yes um, of course uh, uh, research based papers uh, would be better idea especially in experimental research but it depends um, on the discipline. I suppose that in uh, humanities and social, social science, the situation could be a little bit different. And uh, this could be also, this review paper could be also value for some disciplines. But uh, yeah, mainly uh, re original research-based papers, um, uh, it's a better idea. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mabojata. Um, with this question, I would also like to thank all of you who contributed questions. Thank you very much for staying with us. Um, there are still some questions uh, in line here that we will not have time to answer. So um, I will add answers to those questions to my final presentation. We will be publishing the recording of this together with the pre presentation with all the answers to your questions. Um, and we will publish this presentation under uh, the recording on, on the National Science Center's YouTube channel. Um, and it is now time for uh, the very last slide. This is the takeaway message. Um, if we can have it on screen, please. Um, yes, so um, with, with all the presentations and uh, with all the discussion uh, afterwards, um, I hope that you will remember that Polonis Bees is really um, a potential life changer. It allows you to combine your skills, your interests and your values. Um, it, and in that it has all the features of a really good job offer. Um, it guarantees you fair, transparent recruit, recruitment. It gives you funds for your professional growth in the new environment. Um, it gives you extra funding for research, which um, also strengthens uh, your pitch at the host institution. As a National Science Center, we have a proven record in successful performance of projects of this kind. Uh, we will support you all the way. And 109 Polonis Fellows who already completed the program um, testify to the success. Uh, over 40 of them successfully applied for NCN grants to continue research in Poland. So um, I hope that our presentation today has um, convinced you uh, that Polonis piece is a good opportunity for you. So uh, my last question for you is, are you ready for a change? Uh, if you are, please stay in touch. Thank you very much for today. And I hope to see you during uh, the interviews at the second stage of the evaluation. Thank you very much for your contributions, um, Malgojata and Sergey. It was very nice to be with you here. Pleasure. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.